Good morning. Welcome to Beverly Unitarian Church online service. My name is Judy Shader. I'm a worship associate. I'm so glad to welcome you to worship today. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation of children, youth, and adults of many races, religions, secular identities, genders, sexual orientations, abilities, education, life experiences, and traditions. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs, striving always to make room for more. All of you are sacred. You are welcome here. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, which are not doctrine or dogma, but rather are shared values and moral guides. To learn more about these principles, please visit our denominational website, www.uua.org. Our minister is the Reverend David Schwartz. And today we are fortunate to have as our speaker the Reverend Allison Farman. Our special musicians today are Greg Lawler, Maria Mosier, Renee Wilson, and myself. We especially welcome visitors and hope you'll stay for the virtual coffee hour after the service on Zoom using the link that will be shared in the chat. We look forward to the day when we will be able to meet you in person. Although we currently remain distant socially, physically, we can stay connected. To get more involved, check out our Facebook page and our website. Contact the office to sign up for our monthly newsletter and weekly Friday email blast and to be connected to the Reverend David for pastoral care. And now, let us join together in spirit and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Even when our hearts are broken by our own failure or the failure of others cutting into our lives, even when we have done all we can and life is still broken, there is a universal love that has never broken faith with us and never will. For this morning's chalice lighting, I offer you the image of the lotus, the reminder that great things can bloom out of the dark, nurturing soil of muck, and that we, as a people of faith and conscience, are not necessarily all about the blooming, that we might embrace the mucking about together the trying together in the presence of love and for the possibility of beauty as a collective we light our chalice today not for perfection but for process
laugh, we cry, we live, we die, we dance, we sing our song. We need to feel there's something here to which we can belong. We need to feel the freedom just to have some time alone. But most of all, we need close friends we can call our very own. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we are found. Sunday morning at the Beverly Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Allison Farnham, and I am the Director and Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministries of Illinois. I also serve as an affiliated community minister with Second Unitarian Chicago in Lakeview. It is so right and good for us to come together and virtually connect, and so it is my privilege and my honor to be with you this morning. Let us recite our covenant together. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is the great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. They roll the concrete over it and try to hold it back. The concrete gets tired of what it has to do. And after a while, the grass breaks through. And God bless the grass. God bless the truth that fights toward the sun. They roll the lies over it and think that it is done. It moves through the ground and reaches toward the air. And after a while, it's growing everywhere. And God bless the grass. God bless the grass. Tender, it's easily bent. But after 
Ours is a simple faith. Life is a short embrace. Heaven is in this place every day. Hope is the ground we till. Make each day what you will. Thankful for dreams fulfilled every day. There is no hell to fear, no judgment day drawing near. Trust that inner voice you hear every day. Life's not a goal or race, it's about heart and faith, living a life of grace every day. Our story today is The Drawing That Talked. It's about a little boy named Pinty who loved to go to school and do other things except for writing and drawing artwork. He wasn't very good with brushes and pencils. But one day he found a pencil that was so beautiful that he just couldn't resist. And he picked up a piece of paper and he drew a circle. Hmm. As always, it didn't turn out very well. But then he heard something. Psst, ugh, don't leave me like this. At least give me some eyes. The drawing talked to him. He was shocked, but he did manage to draw a couple little dots. The drawing, ah, oh, looked around. Don't leave me like this. Rub me out and try again. I'm sure you can do better. So he took another piece of paper. He drew another circle. Huh. It still didn't turn out very well. Hey, you forgot the eyes again. Okay, okay. So, Pinty raced, he put the eyes in, he, he kept drawing all afternoon and the little drawing, his little teacher kept saying, oh, try again, rub me out, rub it out, but not so hard, it hurts. And he got better and better. <laughs> The little drawing kept talking to him. He said, give me some hair. I look like a lollipop and other funny things. So he kept working and working all afternoon. And finally, by the end of the day, he was pretty good. He could draw probably as good as any kid in his class. Before he went to bed at night, oh, he thanked his little teacher the teacher said, I didn't do anything silly. You've been practicing and practicing and you've been enjoying it. That's probably the first time in your life you've ever done that. Pinty thought about it. It was true. He'd never really tried drawing for more than 10 minutes before and he'd always been grudge, grouchy and angry about it. You're right, he said. And before he went to bed, he said, thank you. Anyway, he put his pencil away and he went to sleep and slept so well, had good dreams. He woke up in the morning, he ran to get his pencil. It wasn't there. 
And the paper, although it had rub marks on it, it was totally blank. Had he dreamed the whole thing? To be sure, he got another pencil and he drew, he drew very carefully. And he could still draw. There were a couple little jagged ends in that. And he imagined his new little teacher telling him, rub them out, make them better. So he did it. And he realized that the crazy little teacher had been right. It made no difference whether you had a magic pencil or not. To manage to do things, you only needed to keep trying and to enjoy it. This week has brought both joys and sorrows, both successes and failures, both celebrations and concerns to us as individuals, as families, and as communities. I light this candle to honor that which expands our hearts, that which breaks our hearts, and that which offers hope to us this morning. One joy that I want to share is that we were able last week to meet on the church lawn for an ice cream social. It was so heartwarming to see all of our friends. Now let's share your joys and concerns in the chat. Patience. May we remember that the journey is just as crucial as the destination. For upon the journey we learn what must be done once we arrive. May our journeys prepare us for what awaits, and may we be met with kindness along the way.
It's hard to keep a clean shirt clean. The poet June Jordan reminds us that it's really less about having a clean shirt. It's more about the beauty of the fabric and how we are always in process, how we are always learning and that life, if we're open to it, can give us a new patina, if you will, that, as she says, is not perfect, but it's beautiful. Growing up, my ideas of beauty and perfection were very different from how they are now. Now, maybe you are different from me, and that's okay. I want to embrace all of the differences that are in these rooms, in this cyber space that we're creating. But for me, perfectionism was deeply embedded in my culture. And at first, I grew up joking with my family that with I had to be a perfectionist because we have perfectionists on both sides of the family. What I didn't realize is that it's much more deeply embedded in white culture and that activists and organizers who work for systemic change like Tima Okun have recognized these principles of how white culture can play out in systems. And one of those ways is through perfectionism. I'll never forget in a national gathering, actually a continental gathering of colleagues, the Reverend Alma Faith Crawford shared with us her observation that in Unitarian Universalism, the F word was failure. It was a way of, of course, making a joke and making light of a deeper truth. Failure, it's a hard word. It can be a harsh word. And yet for me to be able to acknowledge my failures and my imperfections, it's what's allowed me to rest in a larger love and understand that it's not just me and my own ambitions and wants and desires and goals that, uh, that fuel all of the movements that I care about. It's that I'm participating with a larger group of people, a collective, and a, with the source and spirit of love and life itself. And so it creates a larger sense of collective imagining. And then by inviting and noticing the places where I'm failing, it allows me to ask for support and help in times when I need it. So yeah, it's okay if I fail. And yet we're in times where it's very clear that some of our relationships are failing and that we have an opportunity in this acknowledgement of failure to then begin to understand how to repair relationships or to invite that repair, to participate in systems that care about acknowledging harm and deciding to address the harm and then finding collective ways of moving forward differently and systematizing those changes, even with the expectation that those changes someday may change. This is a beautiful resource that we have in our liberal religion. The white theologian James Luther Adams wrote in 1977, in Guiding Principles for a Free Faith about the key values of our liberal religious religion, religion. And part of what he writes about in writing about Unitarian Universalism is that we are in an ongoing process of revelation. As he put it, revelation is not sealed. And I love this idea of opening up the idea of wisdom being all around us for me, it keeps me humble. 
it keeps me open to where the teachers are and what's teaching me, whether I wanted it or not. But it's also this ongoing sense of me having to release control. The white feminist theologian Sharon Welch writes about this in, in terms of there being an ethic of control or beginning to develop from that instead an ethic of risk. An ethic of control is this idea that um, potentially even in social movements, there are those who claim an ethic of control by having an idea and a goal and working towards it doggedly. But then when new information comes in, new voices, or perhaps even finally centering the voices of those who need to be centered, that still there's this rigidity and sealing off from any new revelation. Instead, wanting to control where it's going. And the reality is that instead, the better approach is to engage in an ethic of risk, which is this notion for many that is very difficult, which is that many of the changes that we work towards, we may or may not ever see in our lifetime. There are some very, very big ideas in Unitarian Universalism. The idea that no one is beyond redemption. The idea that all are loved. These are huge ideas. And with an ethic of risk, we can begin to reclaim a collective sense of reimagining this world in which we live. Even though it goes beyond what we now know through sensate data. And yet somehow we continue and we will adapt and change and flow and be part of a larger collaborative process that doesn't hinge about around one person's revelation, right? That's not our style. No, instead it's a multiplicity of voices and also taking the time and even the risky effort of showing up in spaces and making mistakes and apologizing and figuring out ways to make it better and then staying in it and keeping on, keeping on. Because it's not about the clean white shirt, right? In fact, Hosea Ballou, the universalist theologian from back in the day, he was a, a white man who was a, a preacher and a bringer of the good news of universalism amongst many others. And he talked about a story about um, when someone asked him, well, how can you extend grace to bad people? How can you do that? And he said, well, if you're a parent and your kids go out and get totally dirty, it's not like you, when you, you clean them all up and get them clean clothes, you don't, you don't love them because they're clean now. You clean them because you love them. And so if we can begin to embrace an ethic of risk, where imperfection and mistakes, and yes, even failures, and even having to redefine what success really is, if we can begin to, to embrace that, it also begins to um, beg a certain trust in a source of unconditional love. And that can be known in many different ways and in many different words. And that we are part of this, this larger process and movement of the spirit of love through the world. And we can know that in many different ways, whether from just simply a network of hands and hearts that's greater than the sum of its parts, or perhaps God, or that we're part of this, this ongoing evolution of the cosmos, and that we as humans have a place with the evolution of our brains to begin to understand how we can collectively imagine. So I had asked you to bring two pieces of paper with you. And if you want to, you can do this. And if you forgot or you didn't read the pre-service um, blurb, it's okay. But if you happen to have two pieces of paper with you, you can join in. I'm gonna grab my paper. Take a piece of paper and write down something that um, perhaps is getting in the way that's a barrier for you in reaching these larger uh, visions that you have. It could be for your life, it could be for our world. 
it could be for your family, whatever that is, you can just write a word that's getting in the way of that. Um, it could be a confession of your failure, uh, an embrace of your imperfection, um, just just to hold in this uh, spirit of generosity the words of June Jordan that it's not perfect, but it's beautiful. So I'm going to write down my word. You could also draw an image if you wish of something that is a barrier for you. And I'm going to show it and you can show yours if you wish. And you could go on gallery view and or go swiping around and see what other people have put down. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this and you can do what you wish with this. For myself, I am going to choose to be rid of it. And I don't mean rid of it like I am going to perfectly let go of judgment and then be really judgmental to myself later about it. So it's understanding that we're all in process and then I may loop back to some old patterns and then I have the opportunity once again to engage in the practice of embracing the places where I fail. And coming back to celebrating the opportunity to try and try again. And so in celebration of that, I have my confetti. And you can do what you wish with yours. And then what I want you to do is to take your marker or your pen on another piece of paper and write down that larger vision that you have for yourself or for society or for your family and to write that down and then you can share that also so take a moment to think about what that was um, or it could be something new that's just come to you because we are in a flow and always learning so take a moment to write that down or draw an image an image is fine and then you can share that. And if you don't have time to really look about at all of these things, you can check it out maybe in your social time. If you have social time next Sunday morning or after, after our service this Sunday. Of course, this is a, a concept that is um, a guiding vision for our Unitarian Universalist Prison Ministry of Illinois that is absolutely theological in nature. This idea that no one is beyond hope or redemption. And also the idea that all of us are, are part of that interdependent web of life and we need one another. And we each have our own freedom to choose how we live. And yet at the same time, we are responsible for one another and can steward ourselves differently in the world and in our relationships. And this I share with you as a hope and a vision of a day when we can look back and, and think in amazement and awe and deep grief and sadness that there ever was a time when we put human beings in cages. So I'm going to keep this and I'm going to keep it at my um, personal home altar. And one of the things that I learned in seminary, and I'm always learning still from uh, going back and remembering the words from my preaching professor, David Bumbaugh, he, he told us that the sermon is not something that ends when the preacher finishes the words. But the sermon actually completes itself in all of you who are receiving it. And it can complete itself in a number of different ways by you hearing what you need to hear. It could complete itself in ways in which your heart or is moved or that you hear something new 
that can become something new in your life, some kind of ongoing revelation. Whatever it is, I hope that it is something that can carry you forward into a world and into a world that embraces an ethic of risk, of playfulness, and of imagination, where we don't have to do everything perfectly, where we can make mistakes and try again, and be held by a larger love that supports us and perhaps even imagining that somehow the spirit of love is conspiring on our behalves and waiting for us to participate and collaborate in this collective reimagining together. And I can tell you, as I requote the words of June Jordan, it will not be perfect, but it will be beautiful. Amen. to be in process, playful, curious, embracing the spirit of revelation that is never sealed, in a world that is never perfect, in a world that is filled with love. May it be so. Amen. Courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is a quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. Mm -hmm.